Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Live by the Beat. Vernon Foster here. I got my man Simon Tan. He is uh, coming to us live from uh, Portland, Oregon. Simon is is an American musician, author, author, record producer, and activist. He is best known as the founder of the Asian American dance rock band The Slants. In addition to his music, Tam has also actively been involved in the music industry as a regular contributor to uh, various m magazines and groups, uh, most notably Music Think Tank, ASCAP, Lifehacker.org, and Last Stop Booking. Today he's going to tell us uh, and give us some insight into bands and artists and how DJs can go about getting booked for tours. So uh, let's let's get right into it, Simon. Uh, tell me your your background within the music industry and, and kind of how how this got started. Sure, um, I actually started playing music when I was like five or six years old, so I got in pretty early, as I guess you could say, um, and just kind of learned guitar and ukulele, bass, that sort of thing. And growing up, I kind of always wanted to be involved in the music industry. So um, I decided I didn't really want to wait. At the age of 13, I started my own record label and promotion company and started managing bands in San Diego, uh, booking tours, putting out albums, distributing it to, to local stores, and then uh, started my own merch design company at that time period as well. Um, and it just kind of hasn't stopped from there. I mean, it, I started joining bands later on in my teens and, touring the country, playing as an artist myself, and at the same time, um, helping other musicians kind of get gigs along the way. And uh, most recently, in the last couple of years, I started up uh, a music industry blog, uh, Last Stop Booking, and so I would answer a lot of questions that people had about touring, about sponsorship, and that sort of thing. And uh, and that's been going really well. I've been enjoying doing that for well now, and still playing music on the side. Nice. So, so you got into music at an early age and kind of, um, sounds like you, you didn't really wait for someone to give you like a pass, you know, or, or, or a uh, opportunity. You just kind of created that for yourself and at a very young age started a record label and, and now you're doing, uh, you've kind of transitioned more into doing stuff with Last Stop Booking. Tell us, tell us about Last Stop Booking and what, and what that entails. Sure. Um, well, really it's kind of like a boutique booking agency, so. Um, I do a lot of arts consultation with, with people who kind of want to know what the next steps are in their career, um, how, to, how to get by without a record label, or even if you do have a label, how to really kind of leverage that relationship. And we also do a lot of bookings, so um, I do events all across the country. I've booked um, a little bit over 1,600 shows now, and uh, including for my own band as well as just other artists out there. And just uh, anything kind of re revolving around live events that's, that's kind of what I do nice and let's let's talk about um, in, in terms of the bands and the artists what are some of those determining factors like when would a band know like they're they're ready to go on tour and what are some of the determining factors when setting up a, a tour sure well uh, first of all I think a lot of artists have this idea in their head that they think touring is going to be some kind of magic bullet where like, you hit the road and all of a sudden you, you get fans all across the country, but the yeah. reality is quite a bit different than that. It takes a lot of preparation. Um, I would say that you know it's time to get out of your town and start kind of creating uh, more shows regionally or even nationally when you just have played your town to death and you need to start reaching out to the audience. Um, and I kind of think of it like this, where you start out in your hometown, and that can kind of be like home base, and you slowly play further and further out, like 50 miles outside of your town, then 150 miles, then maybe 300 miles, and each time you go a little bit further, building that buzz as you go along. It, it doesn't make sense to play on the opposite side of the country, um, because it's really expensive, and it takes a lot of resources to get there if you have no, nothing in between to kind of sustain your tour. So... Um, it definitely makes sense to develop that audience as you go along and, and then kind of be really strategic about where you play. And as far as just timing goes, I mean, there's no magic formula of like what, when you should go on tour. Um, but 
but it is important to develop that momentum and to just be really smart about it. In the band I'm in now, The Slants, well, we were on tour within three months of our first show, but that's not normal. Most most bands will play their own hometown for at least a year or two first. And that's that's pretty impressive. <laughs> three months, and um, kind of going along that line, um, what what are some of the key issues to take in consideration? So let's say I'm a local band um, in Orlando, Florida, where I'm based, and I've played. Let's say I've been playing locally here for about a year or so and I've built up a solid fan base, solid social media following, and uh, we're kind of looking to start to branch out now. What are some of the key issues uh, to take in consideration? Like, um, you know, should it be time with an album release? Um, uh, is there a season, the right venue, kind of some of those factors? Yeah, I mean, all those things are definitely good to consider. Putting out a new album is definitely good because that helps. Um, it gives something that press can wrap their heads around and venues can kind of grab onto. It's like, hey, there's a lot of momentum going on for this band, and we're going to kind of ride that wave. So that's always a good idea. Um, some people just tour all the time. Um, my band is one of them. We, we kind of tour every couple of months. But um, that's just because it's right for our market and it's right for what we do. Mm -hmm. I think it's just important to find opportunities to that where you can kind of leverage multiple things happening. So if, if you do have an album coming out, if you have a new op music video coming out, those are excuses for fans to like really jump in and be a part of the conversation or for, for media to cover you. So that, that definitely helps. Um, it also has to make sense financially. I mean, going on tour is an investment. So if you don't have the money to do it, there's no sense in going broke trying to play other shows. <laughs> uh, you know, that, and that's a really unfortunate status of things right now that the clubs just aren't paying touring yet. So it's really important to kind of find ways to to make sure that it makes sense and that it's right for the act. Yeah, that that was kind of gonna be my next question. So like a lot of you know a lot of uh, good things have happened over the last few years with the decline and um, with the increase in technology and and the uh, the use of the internet, P 2 P sharing. It's 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 afforded people to, the opportunity to connect with their fans, um, and you can pretty much have a studio in your house, you know, with a laptop, an Apple computer, and you know a DAW. Um, now, how, how, what are some of the things that, like, let's say you're you're just getting starting out, you have a solid fan base, but you have no money. I mean, what are, is there any opportunities in terms of sponsorship that you know these guys can, you know, try to put together or, or anything like that, or, you know, uh, how should they Definitely. get? Definitely. Sorry, I cut you off. Sure. Well, oh no worries. I mean, a lot of times when when people are starting it out, starting out. It's going to be their own money or somebody close to them. I mean, that's just the reality of it. When I, when I first went out on tour uh, with this band, I took out a second mortgage on my house to, <laughs> to pay for the tour and to, wow. to buy vehicles and stuff like that. Um, but I knew that was the right move for us at the time. Um, getting sponsors is definitely a good idea, and it's actually a lot easier than, than what most people think. Um, in fact, I wrote a, like a book about it and just kind of went step by step on how to do this thing. And it's basically finding partners who would be willing to step up. Sometimes it's are maybe local businesses, and sometimes that might be a national company. <coughs> Chances are, though, the, the first people that are going to jump on board are those who already know the band. So those in the local community, probably friends and family, if anything else. It doesn't have to be, you know, Gibson or Fender or, or uh, some big-name music company. In fact... Those companies generally don't provide tour support anyway. They usually provide uh, discounts for, for artists for music instruments, and that's I can feel the guessing. So yeah. I would say work with a local business and, and pitch it to them in a way that makes sense for their business. The, the other thing is if you don't have money to go on tour, um, you should find a way to get that cash. If you have a lot of momentum going on, if you have a good social media presence, maybe that's a good time to try crowdsource campaign, Kickstarter. So there are ways to do it. And even if you don't have any sponsors, there, even if you don't have any money in the bank, 
you can if you have a good audience, and, uh, good following, then you can use that to to help fund the tool. Nice. Nice. So you're saying it's not out of the realm of of possibility if you don't have you know if you don't have like you know a lot of money saved up in your bank account or you're just kind of bootstrapping um, using local sponsors and and then um, you know the the crowdfunding such as, as Kickstarter. Yeah, definitely. Uh, is there any advice for um, you know reaching out to these yeah. venues? You know, when you're putting together these tours, and and let's talk about some of the challenges um, versus you know small venues and big venues. I, I know I I read in your article um, you you kind of pointed out some differences in between the two and and how you could strategically go about that. Um. Yeah, definitely. Whenever touring, I always say that it's better to play a place, play a place that's a little bit too small than one that's too big. <laughs> and you always want to make it feel like you, you sold out the place, not that it's half empty. So, <laughs> um, and and also venues that are a little smaller, they have lower overhead, so they can pay you more, um, and they're usually more willing to work with touring acts who don't have like established crowd in that town too. So there's a lot of advantages there. Um, as, far, as far as reaching out to them, there's two ways to kind of go about it. One is what I call the shotgun approach, and this is what a lot of bands do, is they write a generic booking email, and they just BCC in like every venue in the town and just start blasting people, hoping somebody <laughs> will answer their email. Um, the other way, the, the more effective way, is to do a little homework, find out who, who's at the venue, and write a personal email to that promoter or work with local uh, promoters in town who can put on a show. Um, maybe even doing some research and finding out local bands in that area and putting together a bill for them. These days, pr most promoters want you to approach them with a full lineup in mind. They don't want some touring band that they don't really know coming to them and then making them do the actual work of finding other bands in town that can fit that bill and put something together. Um, if, if you do all that work for them, say, hey, I have local bands there, we have some fans there, we can put on a good show, and it makes more sense for them to, to say, yeah. Nice. So you're, you're, you're reaching out to local promoters to leverage that relationship versus the venue, um, because they're, in my mind, they're already established there, so they have a network that you can almost feed off of, I guess. That would be sure. Yeah, and sometimes it's going to be the venue itself. Um, either way, I would say that no matter what, when you're reaching out to these people, the number one question that you should be answering is how can you make them money? They don't, you know, as, as much as we would like to think people are in it because they love music, because they want to support musicians and scene, the reality is that at the end of the day, they have to pay the bills. And if they continue to put on shows and bands who don't draw people in, they're going to go out of business and they can't put out a stage at all. So they want to know how you can bring people in. Now you can either say, we have a publicist, we're going to get press on the show, or we have uh, you know, a lot of fans in the area, we have a guaranteed draw, or you can say we're working with local bands who have a good reputation and pull, and we're going to put together this build where you make good money, we have great music, and everyone has a good time. Okay, nice. So you're coming from more of a business angle than, hey, you know, we're we're we 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 love doing this, and and if you guys listen to our CD, you're gonna love us. <laughs> you're gonna love us, and you'll want to book us. So yeah. kind of providing some value in terms of of not just the the music, but in terms of like how you're gonna how are you gonna put money in their pocket too. So definitely, and I would say that's the case whether you're looking for a show whether you want to get a label, whether you want to get a sponsor, or you want to get a booking agent. I mean, at the end of the day, everyone wants to know how they can get paid. Um, the other thing is that, you know, as people in the industry, we just get pitched to all the time. I mean, I would say I get between five and 700 bands a week emailing me, and they all say the same thing. They always say, hey, we're really hardworking, we're really unique or we have a really good sound. It's like if everybody says that, then it doesn't really mean anything anymore. Um, Absolutely. It, you know, if, if, if a club gets those kind of emails all the time, they're just going to, I mean, it just gets washed out. You have to find a way to stand out. And one of the ways is saying, hey, 
not only do we sound awesome, but here's how we can make you money and make your customers happy. That that'll make you stand out right off the bat. And make it also makes them willing to actually go to your website and listen to it. Because the reality is, if you're getting pitched by a couple hundred bands a week, you don't want to go to hundreds of websites listening to music. Most of the time, the music's not all that great anyway, or it might not be the best fit. So, um, starting off with how they how it makes sense for them is the way to go. And then, in terms of um, let's talk about like routing when you're routing these tours. Um, how how does is is there any suggestions for that like kind of you know like if you're in Orlando and you're gonna go to to Texas you know would you recommend how would you like how do you strategically set something like that up to where it's it it makes sense um, in terms of like you're not just going straight to Texas and you're doing that one show and you're flying back to basically get the most bang for your buck I guess is where I'm going with that one. Sure. Well. Um... You know, Google Maps is like my best friend when it comes to routing because I always look at a set of dates for any artist, including my own band, <coughs> and uh, see how much distance we want to travel and kind of work backwards from there. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. <laughs> and then in terms of... Uh, so so in, in, in terms of capitalizing off that do you do you just do um like let's say you're going from orlando to texas do you do you recommend kind of routing the tour to where it i guess what i'm trying to go where where it makes sense in terms of not just doing that one date how do you how how would one strategically put that together in terms of um, uh, in terms of networking and in terms of um I'm trying, trying to, I'm, I'm kind of, my thoughts are kind of getting jumbled up here. I guess what what what, what I'm trying to say is that how, how how do bands make it worthwhile, or or what some of your suggestions for them to make it worthwhile, to in terms of in terms of the tour and getting the most the most bang out of it versus just doing these one like a one off one date deal. Sure. Well, first of all, I wouldn't recommend doing the one off date unless. Uh, you're getting paid quite a bit of money to make it worthwhile. And that's something that a lot of artists, I think, kind of uh, make a mistake when it comes to that. Because they'll, they'll look at opportunities. Like, say, you get uh, accepted at South by Southwest for a showcase, and you're from across the country, you're like, it doesn't make sense to go to South by for one show. Because chances are those one-off gigs don't really make that payoff, financially speaking. It uh, usually costs a lot more to get there than you get out of it in the long run. Um, <clears throat> so it, it has to make sense for the long-term goals, but it also has to make sense on, on, on the kind of balance sheet, making sure that you get enough money to get there. The smarter way to go is, if you have an like, incredible gig to get, get to, is to build that tour. So, you know, making step, steps along the way and, uh, <clears throat> you know, usually I do it by time. So, say I had um, two weeks to, to cover the West Coast. Well, then I know if I drive an average of, you know, two or three hundred miles a day, I can I can make make it to where I want to get to on time and be back home in time to go back to work or, or whatever I have to do. <clears throat> and so I just kind of plot plot along using the map to find out what are the cities in between and then find venues there. That, that makes sense to kind of build the tour around. And that that is if you're building the tour around something like a festival or a really big really gig. If you just want to go on the road, just to go on the road, then I would say make a list of the places you want to hit up, how far you want to drive, how far you want to be on the road for, and then kind of work up a route based on that. Okay. Yeah, that, that definitely makes more sense than just. You know, going to doing the one-off thing, planning, like strategically planning up until that point, kind of hitting the smaller, maybe the smaller markets on the way. Um, it looks like we've we've pretty much covered it. I mean, um, I, I wanted to hit a little bit on the book that you mentioned because I did see that. Uh, w is that something that recently came out, or 
Did you want um, to kind of plug that and tell people? It's actually been up a little bit. Sure. Um, so I, a while ago, I, I started writing articles on my blog about sponsorship, and it became such a popular thing. Like People started asking me uh, all kinds of questions about it every single week. It, kind of got tired of answering emails about the same questions. <laughs> um, so I decided you know, I'll, I'll write a book about this. And so I released a book, uh, kind of both a step-by-step how-to guide on how to get sponsorships, how to ask for them. Uh, it has like email templates that people can follow. It's uh, guidelines on how to create a packet, how to make that ask. And I put it together, and now I'm selling it on Amazon for like as low as Amazon will let me. So it's four, four bucks for the ebook or uh, ten dollars for a print version. Um, but it's basically my way to help to help out bands out there or nonprofits. And I come from a fundraising background, so I spent a lot of time raising money for nonprofit organizations and, and, and for bands and tours as well. Um, you know, and it, it does have a lot of kind of that practical advice coming from both worlds of fundraising for a nonprofit as well as a band, but. A lot of it is also to encourage um, artists to be create, creative as well. <clears throat> and so, rather than simply creating like some kind of uh, press kit or a generic packet where you ask for set amount of money, I always recommend building a relationship up with the prospective sponsor and and being more creative about it. So rather than saying, "Hey, give me a thousand dollars or five thousand dollars." And we'll put your name on a banner. Um, do something cool that's different that, that gets people excited about uh, working with you. Uh, for, for example, my band does quite a bit of this. Um, <clears throat> we work with G Sake, which is like a sake brewery here in Oregon. And it made sense because we had the same kind of target audience. But rather than just doing logo placement or something like that, we worked with them to, we wrote an, uh, an unreleased song that we made exclusive for them and we built a website and they put a, a tag on every single one of their bottles of sake, 30,000 bottles of sake across the, uh, North America with our picture, name and link on it so that <laughs> their customer awesome. could get something unique. And that was something really exciting for them. They loved it so much they did it the next year and they paid for us to go to South by Southwest. Um, and then I said, hey, you know, what are some of these markets that you want to get into? Your, your sake is distributed across the country, but where, where do you want to see, see more growth? And it said Texas. I said, okay, why don't we do a bunch of, like, acoustic in-stores, at, like liquor stores or something like that? And um, said, we would love to. We'll just try that out. And I was like, okay, well, I'll just put that along in our tour. We opened up several new distribution channels for them so that their, their market tripled in Texas. And... Wow. You know, we didn't get a whole lot out of it other than, like, you know, a couple of cases of sake. But <laughs> when the next year came around and I asked them for some cash to go up on tour, they were more than happy to do so because they saw all of this return on investment. Um, they saw that we were willing to be creative and think outside of the box and not just pitch them some generic sponsorship. So a lot of what I tell artists is that, you know, we're so creative when it comes to our music, when it comes to songwriting, when it comes to artwork, we should take that creativity and put it into the business aspect as well. So be creative with the sponsors and really build up those relationships. And you, you could do the same thing with venues too. I mean, <clears throat> up until we played those liquor stores, I don't think any other band had ever played a liquor store in, in, in this large chain in Texas before. <clears throat> Why not? Why not make something good out of it? And, have a good time. Um, you know, we we're also the first band in the, according to the U.S. Uh, Congressional Library, the first band to play inside a county library, too. Right? <laughs> we, we, we tour the world. We've played more anime conventions and geek conventions than any other band in the world. It's just, we keep looking for creative opportunities and saying, like, what's the thing that people aren't doing? Let's fill that need. Um, and when you do stuff like that, people get really excited. That's awesome, man. That's uh, that's really cool. That's I mean, I've never heard of a band playing in a liquor store <laughs> or a library, so that's it's it's you're kind yeah, of yeah. Liquor stores, army bases, prisons. <clears throat> I mean, geez, that's, we're having a good day. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's 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 uh, you know, and another thing, 
you know, I, I think about that in, in terms of your band or if you're an artist or a DJ or whatever, that's a whole nother demographic that may not be necessarily looking for your music. Like how many people, you know, that went to that liquor store that day listen to the genre of music that the slants you know play so you're acquiring fans at the same time who may not necessarily have listened to your music before and in and, and you're getting to uh you know there's there's so there's return on investment for you guys as well sure what i could tell you is just we got more weird stairs than anything else because it was like an all asian <laughs> band in the middle of texas playing like a, a liquor <laughs> warehouse you know <clears throat> but we got attention we got a lot of people over to try out the the sake product of our sponsor and um, it made our sponsors happy and that's what made sense for us at that time so um, you know people just have to really get, really hone in on who their target audience is and figure that out uh, so often I run into artists that have no idea who their target audience is they're just like well you know uh, people who go to bars and listen to rock music or something like that <clears throat> that doesn't fly that's way too generic um, I always say to picture your most enthusiastic fan who, who really, really into your music and, and then start thinking about all the other stuff in their life. What are they into? What kind of books do they like to read? What kind of movies do they like to watch? What kind of food do they like to eat? And how can you make your music part of those worlds? Because chances are there's a couple hundred or a thousand people <clears throat> who are just like them who would be interested in the same things. And if you can reach them and they get really excited about you, they'll do the work for you, spreading your music and telling people about your band. Right on, man. Very cool. And in terms of, um, so so, what do you guys, uh, this, this, in terms of the slants with the band, do you guys have anything coming up in terms of touring? Do you have any, um, do you have the, anything coming up in terms of the last stop booking or is that something that you're still actively pursuing are you looking for clients to to uh to consult further with sure um yeah as far as the science go um we're heading out on tour starting next week we're going to be uh, spending a couple of weeks on the east coast coming back and hitting the west um <clears throat> i started this project with them where every month this summer for once a month we're going to release a brand new music video and so we have all these music videos in the hopper, and um, we're tying that in with a national tour. Um, as far as last stop booking goes, um, right now I've been kind of slammed with, with a bunch of work, so the only thing I'm doing is, is taking like consulting clients, so people who want to have like a personalized uh, consultation. And what we'll do is just sit, sit down, it's usually for an hour or so, and they go through all of their materials, their EPK, their music, and and talk about their goals and kind of figure out what the next steps are, what makes sense for them. <clears throat> and um, a lot of times it's, it's finding out uh, the right contacts, like finding a, a publicist that's right for them or uh, tour contacts or that sort of thing and so I can introduce them to, to other people in the industry um, where it would make sense for them to go next. And then I, I take that, uh, the money from consulting and I actually donate it to charity and, um, I do a lot to, to help try and fight for equality in the country for either race or LGBTQ rights. Um, so it's a great way to give back to the community, help out an artist, and, uh, and for them to really take some big steps for their, their career. Very cool, man. Very cool. And I, I noticed uh, in, in kind of doing some of the research that you've, you've, you've said you work with uh, a couple charitable charitable organizations. I also saw that you guys, did you guys... Um, Turn down. Uh, it was it a. I don't. I, I'm gonna be wrong on this one, but it was like a Supreme Court decision or something like that. You guys <coughs> trying to fight or? Oh, I thought okay. that was pretty um, cool. Well, we're actually on our way to the Supreme Court. So, um, what's happening there is that we tried to file a, a trademark for a band name, uh -huh. but we got rejected because the the trademark office said that our name was offensive to Asian Americans. Uh, even though we're all Asian American descent, so that's something we've been fighting for three years. Um, we had a whole lot of people help out on this. We have uh, an editor at the Oxford Dictionary, uh, right? We have people on President Obama's staff. We have all these Asian American leaders saying, "No, these guys aren't offensive. They actually are doing good things for the community." Um, this, 
the trademark office is still saying no. And when we kind of came down to it, I said, you know, how come out of over <coughs> uh, 700, almost almost 800 applications for the term slant at the trademark office, only one of them was cited as being racist, which was my, my case. And the guy said it's because, he ultimately told me it's because I'm Asian. He said if, if you're Asian, people are automatically going to think of the uh, disparaging kind of racial slur. But if you're not, people will people think of the normal dictionary definition. So I said, well, you, you're basically rejecting this because I'm Asian. And he said, <laughs> you know, they wouldn't quite out admit it. And yeah. So we're, in, we're in court, right? I'm trying to figure that out. So, um, yeah. Earning a trademark and sometimes we it, it's normally not this a lot not this much work. It's kind of an obscure law from the forties uh, um, that's written that unfortunately is uh, biased towards minorities. So we're working on fighting that right now. Well, I I uh, I think that's I, I appreciate you guys kind of standing up and fighting for what you believe in. I think that's very admirable, and um, I wish you guys well on your quest for that. In terms of the nonprofit organizations, what is uh, kind of what's your what's your background with that and, and helping uh, nonprofits? Well, um, I spent a lot of time in my career working with nonprofit organizations anyway, and plus we were just really passionate about certain causes, so it makes sense for us. And I would also say that um, for bands looking for sponsors, one of the best ways is getting tied in with your own local community, starting by things that are that you're passionate about because a lot of times those organizations they have board members who own businesses and who are looking for opportunities but they want they also want to find people who are also passionate about the same things and who, are, and who want to give back to their communities that's a great way to network um, <clears throat> for us we started jumping on a couple of causes near and dear to us one of them is uh, cancer uh, we've had a lot of a lot of family members who have been affected by cancer. So what we decided to do is um, for our second album, we donated 100% of the profits to the uh, American Cancer Society. <clears throat> and uh, it's specifically to fund research that uh, is looking for preventive cures for uh, women affected by cancer. And so that was a big part of what we did. Uh, another one is for this organization called Liberty in North Korea. And what they do is they rescue refugees from North Korea. And so we, we kind of started out by featuring them in our newsletter because every December we feature <clears throat> two or three nonprofits that are like our favorite organizations and tell fans like, hey, for Christmas, uh, give back. Here's some great organizations you can start with. And uh, a lot of our fans really liked Liberty in North Korea. Some of them started fundraising clubs in their high schools to raise money for the cause. And so we thought <clears throat> it's something that we connect with, our fans really connect with. And so let's take this relationship to another level. And so we've been helping them with a couple of fundraising campaigns, um, awareness campaigns. We'll do videos and do a lot of stuff on social media as well. And so um, in the last year, we actually raised enough money to rescue about six North Korean refugees. Wow. So it's been really incredible. They'll share us photos and stories and videos of the people they've rescued, and <clears throat> it's just such an incredible privilege to, to do stuff like that. You know that just by us making music and, and, and telling our fans about it, that we can literally save people's lives. So it's definitely awesome. Yeah, man, that's uh, that's really showing the power of <clears throat> of what music can do. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So, yeah, th I mean, there's just a lot of great, great causes out there. And so, um, you know, most recently we're gonna, we're connect we've connected with uh, the National Runaway Organization that helps uh, at-risk youth who run away from homes and, and they provide resources and a hotline. And, and so we're going to be connecting with them and helping them um, raise more awareness about their organization too. And it's, it's just really cool. Like we... Uh, on their last Liberty in North Korea campaign, um, there were one other band joined on board with us, and that was Young the Giant. Uh, for the National Runaway one, we have like, Ludacris, who's like interested, and so it's just really cool to be working with other artists, especially ones that we look up to, knowing that they are, they're all passionate about the same cause. 
it gives us a chance to work with them to release the message too. Very cool. Very cool, man. Well, is there any is there any last um, advice that you wanted to give in terms of uh, the the booking process? Um, how artists can go about you know setting up touring? I know I know we kind of covered a lot here, and uh, I'd like to do a recap. But before we get into that, any any last words or tips? Um, you know, really, when it comes to booking and anything else, I I always say to really focus in on your niche audience. Figure out who, who that fan is who's going to be super excited about the music and do everything to work around them. Um, as, for, as far as booking goes, as long as you understand someone's motivations for something, it's a lot easier to get what you want out of the deal. And for better or worse, music venues, bars, clubs, and promoters, they, they want to make money so that they can keep on doing what they want to do. And I think that's fair. They, they own a business, they want to they want to stay a business. And so when you write to them, you email them, you call them, speak to them. Find a way to get that across. Because there are, even if you have really good music, and I have no doubt that there's a lot of talented people out there, there's always going to be someone else who's just as talented who could bring in a few more friends in the door. Um, and when at the end of the day, that's who the promoter is going to want to go with. It's those people who are going to make sure the bar is not empty that night. And they want to know there's people who are there to, to sell drinks, essentially. And so, if you speak to that and find out a way to <clears throat> where you can not only convince them that you can bring in people through the door, but also find out a creative way to bring people in the door, then everyone's going to be happy. You can have a much more successful tour or music career. Uh, those venues, when they, you know, once you kind of prove yourselves, they'll be excited to have you back on the road. Um, you know, one of the ways that I was able to build this booking agency was just touring a ton myself and building up those relationships. And so when I when I reach out to club, they they know who I am. We know each other by first name basis. When they <clears throat> if they ever have a change in staff, they let me know right away. And so um, that that counts for a lot. This this industry are, are those relationships. Um, another thing on the relationship building front is like once you get in the door and you actually get a show, I always say do something unexpected. Like one of the things that really jumped out um, that, that helped me build those relationships was at the end of every tour was we would sit down and handwrite thank you notes to every single promoter, every single venue on our tour, mail them all out. I can tell you this. <laughs> No one does. So, when when a venue gets a handwritten thank you note, sometimes they'll include a gift card or a CD if they've really gone out of their way to make the show great. Next time I ask them for a show, you better believe they're going to answer that email or that call because they know we're grateful and that we work hard and we, that we appreciate the work that they put into. So, um, definitely stand out and think about how we can build those relationships further. Right on, man. Well, that's 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 all fantastic advice. Uh, we we've covered everything. You know, pretty much kind of going back to the beginning. Uh, you you got into music at a very at a very young age, and and you you it was it was uh, not a position. You weren't in a position where you you really asked for somebody to, um, you know, give you the opportunity. It sounded like something you kind of just went for, and and based on that, it kind of grew into starting a band and. And being an activist and, and getting involved in within the community and and these different charitable organizations uh, to the point where now you're you're still touring and and also in the process of copywriting uh, the band's name and 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 also giving back to artists with last stop uh, booking. So that's uh, I definitely appreciate you having having um, come on the show today and, and giving your opportunity to educate the the artists. Um, out there on how they can uh, use these tactics to, to grow their fan base and to ultimately be successful in their in their music careers. Sure, and I'm happy to thank you for the opportunity. Well, I'll, I'll definitely be in touch, and uh, hopefully we can get you on the show uh, again, Simon. Sure, sounds great. All right, have a good one, man. You too.